hi you all. Welcome to our PowerPoint on children, both children who are terminally ill and might be experiencing the dying process and also children who are grieving. This is the first PowerPoint in our unit on developmental perspectives. I just want to acknowledge that many of you experienced significant losses during childhood and so you're likely to be kind of reprocessing and re-grieving those as you listen to this material. So this podcast uh, was on basically facing pain and there was a little clip that I thought was really relevant to children, supporting children when loved ones are dying or um, have died or grieving. And um, so I encourage you to listen to the little six minutes ex excerpt. And I want you to kind of reflect, why do we protect children so much from death, dying and grief? You may have had experience with this, either positive or negative. Um, what do you think the pros and cons are of protecting kids? And if you were a social worker in the hospital where Todd's mom was dying, how would you have responded to her if she said, <clears throat> I don't want the boys to see me like this. I don't want them to remember me this way. And so my take on the Hidden Brain podcast clip is that when we try to protect children from one kind of pain, we almost always cause a different kind of pain. In this case, the mom protected the children from seeing her near death, but um, they didn't have any opportunity to say goodbye um, or any have any connections with her at the end of life. So what do we do instead? I'm gonna suggest um, that when thinking about kids dying themselves, other loved ones dying, grieving, that we accept that there is going to be pain for this child no matter what and that we focus instead on preparing them for what to expect and preparing them for what they can do. So if you were a social worker in the hospital where Todd's mom was dying, how could you prepare Todd and his brother to see their mother? My thoughts are, you know, after, of course, talking with the mother about it first and getting her permission, I might say, okay, we're going to go in and see your mom. And I know it's been um, a week, you know, since you've seen her. And I do want you to know that she is looking like she's in pretty rough shape. She's looking worse than when you saw her last. Um, she's Her face is thinner, kind of less color in it. She has less energy. She seems more sleepy. Um, she also has, you know, a tube here, uh, some tape here, a needle here, a machine here, right? Kind of explaining them for all that. Um, but she can still talk with you. She can still hear you. Um, she's, her pain is fairly managed. Um, you can hold her hand or maybe mom has said you can get in bed with her, you know, like knowing kind of what the options are and kind of preparing them. There's, you don't have to rush out of here. You can take as much time as you need. Um, you know, we're not sure how much longer your mom is going to be alive. Uh, and I know you've been talking about this and blah, 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 but I want you to just be thinking about what are the things that are most important for you to say, you know, should your mom die in the next couple of days, in the next week, two weeks maybe, uh, we're not really positive, but what are the things that are important for you to say? That might be, it's a long spiel, but that might be some of my thoughts off the top of my head. Obviously, hopefully I've been talking with these kids and preparing them quite a bit, and this isn't just a one moment. So I suggest rather than waiting for a significant ex event to teach kids about death that we're doing it all along. And so the first way is just in how we socialize them around emotion. So the more we are creating a culture where we name emotions, we model our own emotions, um, we coach them through difficult emotions um, and what to do about them, the more resilient they're going to be in the face of difficult events. The second is just looking for teachable moments. So kids might be bringing up things about why, look at the leaves, they're falling, they're dying. There's books about that, the fall of Freddie the leaf, the dying of the leaves. Um, kids will notice insects or bugs be dead or dying um, on the sidewalk, and we can talk about that. And I'm going to give you some language to explain death to kids. Um, and kids can touch them and kind of see what death is like. Similarly, with dinosaur bones in museums, we can talk about how that animal used to be alive and it's not anymore. And those are all that's left of the animal is its bones. Movies and TV shows, kids... Kids' movies surprisingly almost always have the death of a parent, for example, and so there's the opportunity to talk about that. Um, 
kids will often find a dead bird or a dead mouse. And instead of being like, gross, don't touch that, you could actually walk them through a burial ceremony and talk to them about death and burial, which I'll give some more, you know, ideas about. And then um, this all kind of came out about for me um, because I, in, when I was at the vet school, I worked with a mom and her three-year-old son and the dog had died while the family was on vacation and the parents just didn't quite know what to do. And so they just had the dog cremated and I don't even know that they got the cremains back. I can't remember. And so basically they come home from vacation and the dog is gone. And this three-year-old is having a very hard time understanding what, very smart three-year-old, but having a very hard time understanding what death is. And so the mom was coming up with, and I were trying to kind of brainstorm creative ways. And so some of her ideas were dead bugs, were um, dinosaur bones. Um, and so that really inspired me when I had kids to look for opportunities to explain death early on. So they would already have a paradigm built about it. The way that I did this is when both for both of my kids at around maybe three, um, they would notice a dead squirrel squished out on the road and they would say, what is that? And I would say instead of like, that's gross, you know, it's a dead squirrel. I would say it's a dead squirrel. Do you want to go out and see it? Of course, all kids say yes to that. Um, and usually they had friends with them. I was like, do you all want to come too? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, well, grab some sticks because you can't touch the squirrel, but you could poke it with a stick. And then we walk out there and make sure we don't get hit by cars, of course. And we look at it and we talk about how this squirrel used to be alive, but now it's dead. And then I go through my spiel about what death is. You know, when we die um, and when the squirrel has died, it can't eat anymore. It can't breathe. It can't hear us. Um, it can't feel anything, um, it doesn't need to drink, it can't see anything, and it's not going to be able to come back to life. That was its one lifetime. Um, and I'd let kids kind of poke it and see that it just doesn't respond in the same way, <clears throat> um, that the body is actually different. And then I always threw in a cautionary, and you know why this squirrel died? Because it ran into the road without looking. And that was amazing for keeping my kids safe in the roads. They never ran out into the road without looking because they had seen what could happen. And all I had to do was say, be careful out there. Don't get squished like a squirrel. And they were, you know, totally reminded of what might happen to them. So, um, yeah, look for these teaching moments. This PowerPoint is divided into three sections, just um, some developmental context for three different ages of kids, needs of dying children, and then children in grief. Okay, let's get started with developmental context. Okay, so there's a 10 minute video here. It's older, but it's still really useful in kind of understanding some of kids processing around death, how to talk to kids. Um, and so I encourage you to take a look at it. These are the four common errors that children make when they're younger about death for kind of key areas, key errors, I should say. So the first one is that little kids don't realize that once we die, we don't, we can't eat, drink, move, breathe. It's not sleeping. Um, so we'll see little kids want to feed a dead fish or bury an animal with food in case they need it. So just a quick story about my daughter, Iris, at age four, we were talking about how we were, the vet was going to help our cat pocket to die I was going to euthanize him. And I had, was walking her through all that and I had explained um, the non-functionality of death. I had explained that, you know, when we, when we die, we don't need to eat, breathe, you know, it's sleep, all of that. And I was telling her that after the vet euthanized pocket, we were going to dig a hole and bury him in the backyard. And she was like, we're going to bury him alive. I was like, no, you know, he's going to be dead. And then I went through the spiel again. And so it was interesting to me that she just had a hard time getting it, right? Because that's just one of her cognitive limitations at age four. Um, but after the euthanasia, before we buried Pocket, she held him, um, which was a little disconcerting watching a four-year-old hold your dead cat, I have to say. But I did it because I knew it was important. And she was petting him and she was saying, he can't hear us talking. He can't feel me petting him, right? She was getting that non-functionality. Um, a student brought up the idea of Dio, day, day of the Dead or Dio de los Muertos and how when we leave food offerings out, um, it might create confusion for kids. And so we might need to talk about why we're doing that and how the dead actually can't come and eat the food. 
The uh, other thing that another one that kids, the second one that kids can't get is the irreversibility or finality of death, that once you die, you can't come back to life. And so a two and a half year old, when explained that their dog has died, they might seem like they get it. And then the next day they're like, can we go get Fluffy now? Or they know their dad has died, that's been explained. But then when is daddy coming home? Or, you know, running to the car, you know, the, the, the door thinking that they heard the car in the garage or something like that. Universality is understanding that all human beings may someday die, so they might have a vague understanding of death, but they not, might not realize that they might die or that their loved ones might die. And then causality is understanding kind of logical reasons for why death happens, basically injury or illness, but not things like if I fall asleep, I could die, or if I think a bad thought, I could die, um, which is more magical thinking. Okay, so you can pause and test yourself on this iClicker question. And this one is the cognitive error that Tommy is exhibiting is B, irreversibility or finality. So let's start moving through three developmental stages. In each one, we'll talk about the understanding of death and how to support. So infants and toddlers you know, haven't really built a conceptualization of death yet. Um, and they even struggle to distinguish between living and non-living things. So they might, for example, think that vehicles are living um, because they move. Um, so basically their experience of loss or death is really gonna be about how it affects their caregivers and the availability of the caregiver to take care of them and how that affects kind of daily routines and just you know the promotion of their own development. So quick story, that's a picture of me on the slide there, one of my baby pictures with a really frowny face, and there's a lot of baby pictures of me frowning. And I think it's because, as I may have mentioned to you, my mom's sister was killed six days before I was born. She died in a plane crash, and my mom wasn't allowed to go to the funeral because she was overdue with me. And so my mom was intensely grieving. This is the sister that she'd shared a bed with, you know, her whole life. And, um, and so I think if you've learned about mirror neurons, this is what she looked like when she was looking at me, you know, and that's uh, what I was looking like back. Um, luckily for me, uh, my mom didn't fall into depression. She was able to really engage with me and take care of me despite grieving intensely. But um, if she had gotten so preoccupied with her grief, that would have obviously affected my development. Okay, so what to do at this age between zero and two. and. This will be this top bullet will be the same for all age groups so that the more we can stabilize routines and caregivers stability is such a protective factor for kids <clears throat> um, and so if for example i had an infant or a toddler in daycare and maybe my husband had died which is you know hard to think about of course but maybe i would choose to have a nanny i'd try to choose the most stable daycare that i could get you know like either a family and home provider where it's going to be the same person or someone coming to my house rather than maybe an institution where the caregiver could vary each day. Um, in terms of the emotional availability of caregivers, right, to soothe and respond and comfort, um, that's really important along with this kind of synchrony and empathic gazing. This is where, especially with babies, that we spend time kind of just face to face with them and they're making little sounds and facial expressions and we're mimicking them back and they're doing it and we're doing patty cake and peekaboo and um, you know those kind of simple games <clears throat> but that eye gaze which I didn't know about actually when I was taking care of my kids when they were little and I wish I had done more of basically confirms to kids that uh, they matter and that someone cares for them and is really tuning in to them and then of course having you know a predictable environment where we're playing a lot of the same repetitive games um, same toys um, as much as we can do that the better okay so this set puts a timeline to those cognitive errors that we talked about a few slides back so up until about four or five um, littler kids are gonna think that they're not gonna realize that death is permanent um, they're gonna have to be repeatedly told with kindness you know that no so-and-so has died and when someone dies they can't come back to life and when someone has died, they can't eat or drink, and it's not like sleeping, right? They'll have to kind of keep being told that. They might run to the door and think that the deceased person is there or ask when we're gonna see them again. Um, and again, they may not understand that they're gonna die, that other people are gonna die, other animals. 
and magical thinking will still persist. Um, by age five or so, um, kids get kind of all of the cognitive errors except for magical thinking that still exists. You know, they're more likely to think that they could have done or said something that led to the death. And so we'll be talking about how to address those fears. They also um, are still so in the present moment, right? They don't understand that it, what a death means, that that means forever, because they don't have a conceptualization of forever. You know, it's harder to, for them to think about the future. So they that's why they can seem like really sad one second and then be fine, you know, because they're not, they don't really get kind of what life is going to be like. And um, we will continue to see them use death themes in their play. Um, they might act out funerals, they might act out burials, they might act out illnesses, um, and oftentimes they resurrect too. Okay, so again, stability is one of the best predictors of child outcomes. Um, emotional availability of caregivers. Um, we might see, you know, just, you know, uh, children regressing. Um, so maybe they can't sleep in their own bed at night. Maybe they don't let their parent out of their sight. Maybe they're more clingy. I think it's really important that we normalize this um, without shaming. Um, but obviously with more aggressive behavior, we need to set limits. Um, but we might be seeing things like you know, I've noticed that you've been more out of sorts and you've been fighting with your sister or you've been hitting or you've been yelling or um, whatever it is. And that's really normal after, um, it's normal to feel out of sorts and, and kind of mad after someone we love dies. And so it makes sense that you're feeling that way, but we do have to work to whatever, you know, not hit our friends, not yell, what, you know, those kinds of things as much as we can. Um, in terms of, um, yep, there's lots of books around emotion coaching, and I had some of those on an earlier slide. This can be a perfect time for reading about sadness, and we're gonna get more into books at the end around grief. Um, memorializing activities. Kids this age will come up with lots of neat memorializing ideas if given the latitude or brainstorming. So do you want to help plant flowers? Do you want to help pick out flowers? Do you want to draw a picture? Do you wanna write a note? Do you want me to help write something? Um, Kids, you know, just what would feel you're missing so and so. What what do you want to do to to remember them? Do you want to light a candle? Do you want to play a song? Do you? It's I think it's interesting. You know, the little boy that I mentioned that um, wasn't there when his dog died. The three year old boy. One of the things he wanted to do was sit in a circle with his mom and his dad and pretend to pet the dog. Pretend the dog was in the middle of the circle and pet her and talk to her. And he just kind of came up with that on his own. Um, kids really like objects, linking objects or mementos. So when I was at the vet school, we always made clay paw prints of animals following the death after the euthanasia. And when kids were there, I asked them to just, if they wanted to help me. I never had a kid turn me down for helping to make a clay paw print after their animal had died and wanting to have it. They would walk out kind of holding it. Kids really like linking objects. I know my kids you know, having lost both of Jordan's parents, their grandparents, they like his stuff. They like having something that connects to, to them, to him. Um, and then we definitely need to understand, ask questions whether or not they're feeling like they are any guilty or that there's anything that they could have done to have caused the death. I think it would be, maybe we might just reassure. That would be something we might do, you know, like just, you know, there's nothing you could have done or said, but if I were a little kid, I'd be thinking, well, you don't know how bad my thought was, you know? And so I might say, um, you know, sometimes kids worry that there's something that they did or said that caused the death. Are you worrying about that at all with grandpa? Is there anything that you're worrying about or feeling badly about? I promise you can tell me and it's safe. And, and so then they can tell you what it is. You know, it's almost like they have, you have to confess the worst and then hear, no, nope, there's no way that that could have caused the death. So by about age seven, kids are really grasping that death is final and you can't come back. They have a more reasonable understanding of what of causality, of what causes death. Um, and so they might be saying something like, daddy had something growing in him that's called cancer. And sometimes people get better and sometimes they don't. And he didn't get better. You know, he died, right? Be kind of explaining that. Um, better understanding you know of what this means for the future 
although still it's hard to grasp, you know, for little kids, what this means for your life. Um, more questions about death, more questions about the biological aspects of death. And so I worked with a little girl who was at the vet school who was around seven or eight years old. And after we were sitting there after her dog was euthanized with her mom, and she picked up her, um, the gum, uh, the lip, basically, the, of her, the lip of her dog who had died and said, kind of looked underneath there and said, I like to look at dead dog's gums. And her mom was like, what? You know, and I just normalized, like, it's normal to be curious. You're figuring out what death looks like in a dog's body. When I explained cremation to her, um, she said, will fire come out of his eyes? Right. So just more kind of concrete questions about the biology of death. Um, this can also be the age where um, you start to become aware that bad things can happen. And I wonder if you can remember that age. For me, that was right around nine when I realized that bad things could happen. My parents could die, I could be kidnapped, something could happen to me. Um, so he, here's a, a quote from a nine-year-old. When I was nine years old, I woke up for several nights in a row, shaking and scared. I suddenly realized that I could die too. My father came in and tried to comfort me. But what could he say? It was all too real. My brother had died and I began to understand that everyone dies. We'll be getting into more memorializing activities um, at the end, but kids at this age can be even more involved with planning and, and preparations. Those same two couple bullets at the top, still the same um, as previous ones. Um, there's lots of good books that we can be reading and I've got some of those coming at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, we can also begin to challenge them about magical thinking. Like, and we can say there's nothing that you could have done that, that caused it, but they might not get it. So here's just a little story about that. Um, this is a seven-year-old who said, I had a fight with my father the night before he had a heart attack and died. I thought that's what killed him. Nothing my mother said could change my mind. My mother finally took me to the family doctor. He explained how the heart worked took out a model and explained what was wrong with my father's heart. I could hear this and realized I didn't have to feel guilty about killing him. I started to cry and I began to feel different. And I think this is a great example how sometimes just that quick, you didn't do anything, it's not your fault, doesn't sink in for kids, you know, that maybe we actually have to check in. Are you still worrying about it? Is it still bothering you? And then we have to think of as a, uh, think as adults, what can we do to help them process this? Um, we can be, again, as needed, setting limits um, on behaviors and kind of teaching about grief and emotional expression and naming all the manifestations and normalizing all of that. And then we can definitely be helping with peers. Um, oh, sorry, one more story about that. So one story about Isaac, when he was this age, grieving one of our cats who had died, he was really mad and he was just getting into more trouble with me and with Iris for, a couple of weeks after and so I talked to him about you know sometimes when we're when we've lost somebody that we love it just makes us mad and so it's normal to feel that way and anger can come down into our arms um, and so we need to find some ways to get it out that doesn't involve kind of hurting other people and so my suggestion was that we get those noodles from swimming pools and we go out and whack our trees and that's what I tried anyway I thought it was great I'm not sure how much it helped Isaac, but I think it helped him gain some awareness and some normalization about feeling angry and then what to do about it. Um, in terms of peers, we can help them, at, we can ask questions. What are your friends saying to you? What kinds of questions are you, are they asking? What's hard for you? When do you don't, not know what to say? We can brainstorm with them. Um, what do you say when, a, when somebody says to you, why aren't you crying all the time? You know, how are you going to help kids this age explain that? which is hard to do, but I think if anybody can do it, we can. Okay, so when we think about how much information to give, you know, for say a five-year-old, again, we might not be giving them the, the really difficult details if it was a traumatic, for example, death, um, but we wanna be giving them enough information um, that they're not making things up. Um, and that we are creating safety that they can ask questions if they want, and we can provide more information in a way that hopefully they can understand it. Okay, so now we're just gonna move into a few slides on the needs of dying children. 
This is something that we offer an entire class on, HDFS 404 Child Life. And so I just touch on it a little bit in this class, knowing that if this is an area of interest for you, that you'll likely take HDFS 404. Okay, so um, among children, you can see that in terms of the leading causes of death, um, injury is the number one. And so this depends on the age. For infants, this might be accidental suffocation. For under age five, this might be drowning, um, poisoning, uh, accidental poisoning, accidental drug overdose, or car accidents. Um, congenital abnormalities, you know, varies whether or not we're talking age one to four or five to nine, but this is something that you were born with. Congenital means like birth defect that eventually leads to your death. Um, cancer, again, might vary based on what age group we're specifically looking at. Homicide um, <clears throat> tends to be um, around three or four, and then heart disease. Um, sometimes this fifth leading cause is influenza, or, or in the case of COVID, it was COVID one year, um, but other times it's heart disease at number five. So then if we think about dying children, this is children dying from congenital abnormalities, things that they were born with, from cancer, from heart disease most of the time. Um, so these can be ongoing things that they've been getting treatment for for years that eventually will lead to their death. Um, so what do kids need? Um, there are these four areas, and I've got a slide on each one. Um, trust and information, minimal separation and attachment security, pain management, and access to normal activities. Okay, so the first one being trust and information. So kids need to, to have things explained to them um, in a way that they can understand it. And some of the videos that we're gonna watch are just gonna give kind of nice straightforward explanations to kids. I think it's challenging to figure this out, but I really would challenge you and if you end up in this professional role or personally to figure out how are you gonna explain some you know, unusual things to kids around medical procedures or around death. Um, and there's, again, kids' books out there probably for almost anything that could help you with that. Um, they also need open, um, or so, so yeah, they, they need not to have secrets. They don't need hushed voices. Otherwise, they basically can get more fearful, more isolated. They often can kind of pick up on it anyway. Um, we definitely, as we're, as they're doing things, we need to walk them through what to expect um, from their illness or from this hospital visit. Um, they also need opening statements from adults to basically invite their concerns. And so this can sound like, um, this must be a time when you're feeling confused or mixed up, or I wonder if this is a scary time for you, or kids like you facing a surgery often have questions like this, or um, if I were you, I think I might be a little worried about blank. Is that something that's worrying you? So giving permission with kind of an opening statement for them to share a lot of like this phrasing around other kids or some kids also say might give them more permission and then you can be acknowledging and normalizing that. So it wasn't actually that long ago, 1960s, when parents weren't really allowed in the hospital with kids, you know, there were, there were kids' wings and parents just had visiting days. Um, if you've read Curious George Goes to the Hospital, the man with the yellow hat could only just occasionally visit him. John Bowlby's work actually changed all of that. Um, and so now we know how important it is to have attachment figures there. And so we have more, um, you know, more support because what, what John Bowlby found is that Kids will initially protest having to be separated and be upset and then kind of quietly sad. And then they detach. They look like they're okay if they have to be separated from their key caregivers. But then once they're reunited with them, they're mad. Uh, they felt abandoned and there's kind of a break in the, in the trust. So hospitals are now going to a lot more, you know, changed a lot to allow parents to groom in, you know, to have 24 seven access to kids to be able to cook and eat, you know, within the hospital. Um, if um, ho hospice can be provided in a hospital, it can also be provided at home, pediatric hospice. And so hospice can also help allow kids to more easily stay at home with, with extra support. 
So children in pain was something that we didn't always um, do well. So kind of like with animals, since we since kids couldn't always say, ouch, I'm hurting, I'm in pain, we just didn't really think that they experienced pain. Hence why, you know, circumcisions used to always be conducted without anesthesia, because we just thought kids couldn't, babies couldn't experience pain. Kind of crazy. Um, similarly, animals, we thought the same. Same with maybe um, people who had intellectual disabilities. Basically, if anybody couldn't express it in a, in a, a more stereotypical way, we didn't think that they had pain. So younger kids might be just showing more nonverbal cues. They might be squirming. If they don't have the um, verbal ability to tell you, right, they might be squirming, they might be clenching, they might be rubbing, they might just seem irritable. Um, older kids can begin to point to, you know, like a pain rating scale, like you see here on this slide with a facial expression, a number, a description, and we can, we can read the descriptions to them. Um, in terms of coping and relaxation strategies, I think we can help kids brainstorm what works for them and make a list so that they can remember. Here's one kids coping strategies for chemotherapy. Um, find out what is going to happen and why. Take deep breaths. Get hugs from mom and dad. Count while the needle is in. Think of nice things. It's okay to cry. Distract yourself. Talk to someone when you feel sad. Have a warm or weighted blanket. Um, parents can be a real source of soothing. You know, we know that uh, touch, for example, the research that's coming out around kangaroo care for babies that touch kind of um, decreases pain perception. Some of that's actually coming out for adults as well. Um, that ha holding your uh, the hand of someone close to you can help reduce your perceptions of pain. Um, we may also need to be supporting parents to manage their own anxiety so that they're not just like kind of over Pollyanna, like bright siding cheerleaders, like everything's great, everything's fine, because that really just doesn't give kids much permission to talk about tough things. Um, so we might need to be talking them through that. And then animal assisted therapy also becoming more common and has evidence for kids in reducing perceptions of pain. Okay, so you can test yourself with this eye clicker question. Um, so Sarah's undergoing cancer treatments. She likes to ask the medical staff about everything they do. What is this? That would be A, trust your information. Kids with a terminal illness or kids who are dying also need as much as possible normal activities um, and some consistency active in activities. So just like all of us, they need to have stable things that they know that they can look forward to or that give their day structure. Sometimes those are activities outside of the hospital or as part of their school. Um, and But maybe those are activities that child life specialists are organizing in the hospital. The kids know that that's, we're going to play bingo every Wednesday or something like that. Um, parents, uh, or, or oh, sorry, a couple other things about activities in the hospital. We can have spaces for families to help, you know, prepare food and to eat, um, family dinner. So definitely we're trying to balance a focus on the child's illness with just their a focus on their kind of their normal developmental needs um, to feel competent to have connections with peers to have fun um, obviously parents are going to probably change some rules like maybe you get more screens you know after you've had a chemotherapy treatment or something like that but it's important that parents still have some guidelines and limits um, i think school attendance when possible, and especially if it's beneficial, obviously not if a kid hates it, but that can be really helpful for the social connections, the daily structure, and promoting that sense of competence. Um, with peers, um, kids who have terminal illness or medical severe, you know, extreme medical issues or challenges might need help kind of figuring out how to talk to their peers. Um, so to combat any questions, to combat any teasing, um, you know what to say like why don't you have any hair why does that why do you why do you have this why do you we need to arm them with kind of what to say um, and talk about what questions that they're getting asked that they need help with so this is an older model from the 1970s talking about how terminally ill children might change their self-concept in stages over time um, kind of suggesting that you know you don't just immediately think I'm gonna die. You might think uh, I'm seriously sick, but I'm gonna get better. But now I might not get better. Or um, now, 
you know, I'm definitely not going to get better or now I'm dying. And similarly, siblings um, might have a similar kind of, and other families might have a similar process as they move through um, this awareness. So just to touch on child life programs, I really love these two videos. Um, and so I hope you'll watch them, just giving you a sense of what child life looks like, but also just how to prepare kids um, and how to support them. So child life programs, again, there's a whole, we have a whole class on this, um, help kids, you know, through play, gain a sense of control over what's going to happen to them. So kids who are spending a lot of time in the hospital might have, be able to play with medical equipment. Um, they have, might have medical dolls that they can practice on. They might get tours um, at the hospital or this, you know, surgery suite. Um, so a lot of play, gaining a sense of control, getting prepared, um, that emotion coaching and support. And then child life specialists advocate for kids too. Um, maybe, you know, that they're scared or that they're worried or that they're afraid to talk to mom or dad or somebody else about this and um, or that they have questions for the doctor that they're afraid to ask. And so um, the child life specialist can kind of be the liaison and advocate. So we touched on this briefly when we were talking about palliative care and hospice, but we do have pediatric focused palliative care or comfort care for kids with chronic illnesses who aren't terminally ill. And then we also have pediatric hospice for kids who have a terminal illness and are expected to have, you know, six months or less to live. Um, the Affordable Care Act of 2010 changed the rules around pediatric hospice so that kids could receive both curative care and hospice care at the same time. Adults can't, but kids can. There's a little video clip here just kind of understanding what pediatric hospice might be like and, and um, how it's beneficial. Okay, so let's move into supporting grieving children. So all of the things that you learned in the grief processes PowerPoint, you know, I'd say most of them still apply to kids. So again, we can think of that factors influencing the grief model to understand why each child's grief is going to be a little bit different. Um, and so how primary of a caregiver was the person who died? How sudden or traumatic was the death? Um, what is the nature of the child's family relationships and support systems? How stressed is the family economically? Um, what's the health status, physical and mental, and the parenting abilities of any of the surviving caregivers? Was the child able to see the body or participate in the mem in memorial services? You know, all those things, right, would be factors influencing grief. Secondary losses, um, again, thinking about what those are for kids and naming them and normalizing, you know, the ones that are salient for them. So that sense of someone to give you hugs, that sense of someone to talk to, someone to help you go to sleep at night. Um, maybe there's who, who's making dinner, who's coming to your game. Um, you know, all those things might be secondary losses for kids. Um, or maybe you have to give things up because you don't have, your family doesn't have enough money anymore, or you don't have enough people to drive you, or you know, things like that. Um, in terms of the dual process model, like we talked about, kids do move back and forth between life focus and loss focused more quickly, right? Um, and so they'll seem really sad and then they'll abruptly be like, I'm, I'm fine now, can I do this? Um, so they, it can be a little disconcerting or abrupt for us, but it's normal. In terms of tasks for grief, kids in their own way have the same tasks of accepting the reality of the loss. And sometimes that's challenging because they're young and they have some cognitive limitations. Um, having a continued bond or relationship with the person who died and trying to kind of make meaning. Um, and we as adults can be helping them with that through, for example, memorialization. Kids can show more delayed grief. It's hard sometimes, you know, they, again, because they don't have a sense of time and future. They can't always process it like we do. They might just seem like they're not grieving or it kind of comes out in odd ways. And we're gonna expect that they're gonna grieve at different in different ways as they get older, you know, in different stages, they develop another cognitive understanding or they reach another milestone that they wish a parent was there, this person was there for. And so they're grieving again. And I'm sure many of you can kind of relate to that. Um, kids grief can also be disenfranchised. Basically they're considered some of the forgotten mourners. You know, we just think because they don't always show it like we do that maybe they're not grieving, which isn't true. 
So kids are going to experience a lot of the same manifestations that adults do, but they experience more of some things. So they're more likely to report what's called somatic complaints, like my stomach hurts my is a big one or my head hurts. And so you could say when they say my tummy hurts, hmm, do you think your tummy is hurting because you ate something that isn't doesn't feel good in your belly or because you're missing so and so? Um, they might also be struggling with sleep, right? Um, uh, like, you know, sleep issues. And so we might be having to sleep next to them in their rooms as they fall asleep or have them sleep with us or, you know, things that are kind of temporary and, and working on that. Um, definitely might seem kind of mood shifts, like happy and then sad and then irritable. And so normalizing that. Fears, you know, fears around being separated from the, the remaining people that they love, fears uh, that others will die or that they will die that we need to process. And then kind of that guilt due to, you know, some magical thinking, which I'll say more about that something I did could have caused it. Um, struggling anger, which kind of touched on already is normal. And then we can figure out kind of what to do with that anger so you don't get into trouble. Intellectually, kids are going to have a hard time concentrating on school, so we can normalize that, that that's normal. Your brain can feel foggy. It can be hard to think and focus. We need to be normalizing that with teachers, too, so that they're giving them just a little bit more compassion. Um, behaviorally, kids can often regress. So whatever it was that used to be a problem for them that they're not doing it anymore, now often they're doing it. If they'd stopped hitting, they're hitting. If they'd stopped wetting the bed, they're wetting the bed. If they were able to sleep by themselves, now they're not, right? Um, and so that's just normal. It's going to be temporary. They're going to get past it, but that's a big part of it. And so just saying to them, you know, I noticed that this is happening again. I don't want you to feel bad about it. This is this happens after, you know, we lose somebody that we love. Um, they might withdraw and kind of shut down. Um, and we, it might be hard to figure out kind of what's going on with them. Um, and I've got some thoughts on that coming. They might be more clingy. Um, and we don't want to kind of shame them for that. You know, like, why are you acting like a baby? Um, you need to be a big boy now or whatever. You could just say it's okay that you need more hugs and it makes sense that you want more, you know, you know, help from me or support from me. That's okay. Um, again, it might be coming up in their play, um, with dolls. They might having dolls die and come back to life. And so that can be opportunities for conversation. And then they might be asking those questions like, where are they now? What is heaven? What is heaven like? They might be asking you what you believe. And there are books out there that can be helpful. I'm sure there's even more coming. And with my kids, I read a book with them called What is Death? Similarly, we read a book, What is God? Um, and just walked through all the different belief systems. Now, other people have a specific belief system that they want their kids to adhere to. I was just going trying to give my kids options. I'm going to explain that nobody knows and they get to decide. Okay, so like we've talked about, we want to be a safe person, an askable, approachable resource that no question is too weird or too dumb or alarming, you know. So basically, you want to get your game face on when kids are bringing up their concerns. You want to, even if you might be freaking out a little bit inside, you want to be like, calm, I've got this, I can handle this, I'm unfazed by this. Um, you don't want to be dismissing it. You don't want to be like shocked. You don't want to be like, why would you ask that? Why are you thinking about such things? You don't need to worry about that. None of that, right? Because your goal is that they will keep talking to you in the future about all of their worries and concerns. You want them to talk to you about that. So um, it's a challenge, right? To figure out how to explain things in words that they can understand. And yet I feel like um, the types of majors who are taking this class are the people who can figure this out. And so you can always Google it. How do I explain suicide to a kid? Um, you can always think about it, talk to other people, but I'd really challenge yourself to help come up with the words um, to explain things to them. So I'm going to give you some examples just to help get your ideas going. All right, so let's say six-year-old Ella's dad died of a heart attack and she asks, What's, what is a heart attack? So then I do my best to try to explain how the heart works. And then I'd be knowing, you know, that Ella's probably worried about um, her other people's hearts, you know, and could anybody's heart, you know, have a heart attack or stop working at any given time. So I might keep that in mind when I'm explaining and saying something like most of the time our hearts work 
just fine, you know, especially when we're young, especially for people like me. Um, and doctors can usually fix them if they're not working well. But for your dad, we didn't know that anything was wrong, and that's really unusual. And basically, his heart just stopped working and he died. If Ella asks, you know, where is he now? I'd be thinking, okay, I'm not exactly sure what she means by that. So I might answer it in a couple of ways. I might say, your dad's body is at the funeral home, which I can tell you about. As far as like who your dad was inside, his spirit or his soul, you know, no one knows for sure. And people believe different things. You know, what have you heard people say? You know, I like to believe this. Um, Obviously, this answer is going to depend on whether or not you're um, close, you're, you're a parent and you're kind of sharing your beliefs to your own child or, you know, you're not going to be doing that if you're a professional, you know, working with kids, right? You're not going to be putting, you know, sharing your beliefs. You're going to be just more inviting a conversation about it. Okay, we're trying to give kids uh, permission and lots of choices. So saying things like, um, you can always talk to me or another grown-up like Nana if you're worried or having questions or we can even talk to a doctor or something like if it's okay I'm gonna tell you um, what the funeral for your dad will be like and show you the place um, it will be and then you can decide if you want to go in terms of addressing fears and anxiety kids big fears are did I cause it is it going to happen to me and who's going to take care of me? Um, and I've got some of that addressed on this slide and some on the up an upcoming slide. Um, so the question here, Ella asks, who will take me to soccer? And yeah, maybe you're like, yeah, your dad did so many things for you. And you kind of list off the things that he did. And it's very sad that he can't do that for you anymore. But here's the people are who the people are, your mom, your Nana, you know, your brother, they're all going to be doing these things and making sure that you're taken care of. So sometimes we want to just ask, you know, more, more questions to understand where a child is coming from. And so if Ella were to ask, you know, why didn't he say goodbye? I might just pause and say, Do, are you asking why he didn't say goodbye before he left for work that morning? or before he had a heart attack, or both. And then I, I might just even follow up with, why do you think he didn't say goodbye? And is there anything worrying you about that? Because maybe Ella will say, well, yeah, he had told me to pick up my stuff last night and I didn't, and, and I worried that he was mad and that's why he didn't say goodbye. And so then maybe we'd be trying to explain, right? He left while you were asleep and he didn't know. Um, if he had known that he, that was the last time he was going to see you, he definitely would have said goodbye. What do you wish he could have done or said? Something like that. Sometimes we can give children in wish, you know, what we can't actually give in reality. And then this, these parts about kind of reassuring them that they're not to blame and they're not alone. So are you worried about your hearts or other people's hearts? You know, I bet everybody is who knows who knew your dad is worrying about their hearts more right now. Um, but this is what we're doing to take care of our hearts and we can always go to the doctor, you know, if we think something's not right. And or we could say something like sometimes we worry that we could have done something or said something that made dad's heart stop. Are you worried about anything that you said or did? Um, and then and then just saying, you know, I know that there's nothing that you could have done that or said that could have caused your dad's heart to stop because that's not the way hearts work. But if you're worrying about it, I hope that you'll always ask me so that we can figure it out for sure. And you might say something like, you know, sometimes people say things like, oh, you almost gave me a heart attack when they're scared or surprised. But that's not exactly that's not how heart attacks happen. You know, um, it's something more in the body, not like something somebody said to you. And then we're trying to help kids with their feelings. You know, um, we're doing our emotion coaching, our emotional literacy, we're helping name things. And it's really tough, you know, that you couldn't say goodbye to him. That makes you feel really sad. Um, and we can talk about that as much as you need to. Um, here's a few ideas, and you might even think of something better, but what if we 
wrote a goodbye letter to him or we drew a picture for him. And basically kids are amazing, like we've talked about in coming up with creative ideas. And I think if we can help kids make their grief active, it not only helps process the emotion, but it is empowering for them. It gives them something to do and reduces their anxiety. Okay, if you'd like, this is an opportunity for you to practice. Just kind of consolidate what you're learning. You'll be more likely to remember it. Um, same um, strategies here on the left. And then the scenario that I'm giving you is with nine-year-old Micah experiencing the death of his uncle Jacob in a single car accident. And Micah has these questions. Why did his car crash? Did he do something wrong? Is our car going to crash? And if you want to, just pick a couple of bullet points and think, like, what would I say to Micah? So these strategies are for caregivers specifically, because we know what the research says is that how a caregiver, you know, a parent or a guardian um, supports a, a grieving child has enormous effects on the outcome, for better or for worse. So everything that you may have learned, for example, about um, creating a secure attachment, you know, being an authoritative parent, um, promoting open communication, all that is huge and will have, um, you know, really positive impacts on a child's grief process. So the more a caregiver can provide reassurance, be a secure base, um, then the more a child can seek them out for support. And research has found that the more a child seeks support, uh, the better grief outcomes they have actually over the long term. Um, we've talked about stability um, in routines, and we know that not only that, but any time a child, any time there's any type of loss, whether that's a divorce or a move or a new baby or a death, the caregivers need to be kind of upping their one-on-one -on -one time with that child. I like to think of it as, and it's been called by other people, kind of special time where we are, I'm just giving you my undivided attention, even if it's just for 15 minutes, we're playing together. Um, but I'm really kind of tuning into you, letting you lead the play, um, creating kind of positive interactions. And this doesn't have to be like, rah, rah, I'm a cheerleader and nothing bad has happened, but I'm just really tuning into you, whether that's at breakfast time or play time or dinner time or bedtime, um, to let you know that you matter and, and you've got people that you can count on. We also want to educate them as to what grief feels like. So just using the manifestations of grief and putting it into language that kids can understand, you know, like grief affects us in so many ways. One way is that it affects our bodies. Um, sometimes when people are grieving after someone has died, they feel it in their body. They might feel it in their tummies or in their chests or in their heads or, you know, and then asking kids where they feel it. Same thing with, you know, talking through emotions or if you talk through behaviors, you you know, you could say, you know, a lot of times when we have ha had someone that we love die, um, we just can't hold it together like we used to as well. Like we're just getting into trouble more or maybe things that we didn't used to struggle with, like hitting. Now we're struggling with that again. And so I just want you to know that it's really normal if suddenly you're having hard times or you're having a hard time sleeping. So. And then of course, emotion coaching, you know, helping them put words to what they're, if they're mad, if they're scared, if they're sad, those are, you know, the big ones. Um, and then this bit about modeling grief behaviors. Um, and so you might be thinking like, how can caregivers model grief without um, having kids feel like they have to take care of them? And so this can be just saying simple things like you, you don't wanna put your tears away, right? You don't wanna necessarily overwhelm them at your biggest meltdown with your biggest meltdown, but you can let them see you cry. You know, this is how they know that crying is okay. This is how they know that people often feel better after they cry. And so just saying things like, I'm just having a hard time, or I think I just had a hard day because I was missing so-and-so, um, but I just need to feel sad for a little while and then I'll feel better and I can still take care of you. That's a really important message. Um, the more you can be kind of narrating your own grief process, you know, in age appropriate ways, the more, more it gives kids awareness of how their grief might be affecting them and gives them permission to talk about it. And then of course, anticipating anniversary and re-grief reactions. I wouldn't wait for kids to bring it up because most kids aren't going to, you know, but just saying something like, you know, I know you're gonna be missing your brother for fifth grade graduation. I was wondering if you wanted to wear something of his at the ceremony, what do you think?
kids will often come up with pretty creative ideas if given the space. Okay, so rather than not involving kids in death rituals, my recommendation would be to prepare them for what to expect and then give them the option. Um, and, you know, if you're not sure how to explain something, I'm guessing you could always find it online, how to explain something to kids. Um, but, for example, preparing kids for viewing a body. We want to prepare them for what, what to expect and what they can do. You might be able to find um, appropriate images online for what a viewing in a chapel looks like, right? I wouldn't necessarily find like graphic images of dead bodies, but what a viewing and how the casket might look or something like that. Um, and so you could say, we're gonna have a viewing of grandpa's body. You know, this means that his body will be in a casket, which is, you know, a big kind of wooden box, you know, um, at the front of the room, up on a platform. The lid of the casket will be open and grandpa will be in it, just kind of on, a, on some, you know, like pillows. Um, his eyes and mouth will be closed and the funeral home has put him in his his suit and they've done his hair and they might have even added a little makeup so his skin looks smoother. So he's gonna look like grandpa but he also might not look totally like grandpa when he was alive. And you can touch his hand if you would like. It will feel, you know, like this or you can, um, this is where you can be suggesting you can um, write a letter to him, draw a picture, you can do things, you can put things in the casket with him. Um, so just ideas like that walking them through kind of what to expect, play by play. If you've never done that before and you have no idea what it is. Um, explaining cremation. <clears throat> so we used to explain it like, when we have someone that we love who has died, one way that we can take care of their body is through something called cremation. So just remember when someone has died, they don't need their body anymore, they can't feel anything, and they can't come back to life. So. What we can do with a body is we can put it in um, a very special oven, not like the oven that you have at home, but a different kind of oven that gets really, really hot. It's bigger and it causes all the soft parts of the body to melt away till all that's left are the bones. And the bones <clears throat> um, get so hot that they crumble into little pieces and we call these cremains. Sometimes people call them ashes but they're not quite as soft as ashes on a fireplace. They're more like pebbles on a beach. And when I was a grief counselor, we kept a box of cremains in our office and we would ask kids if they wanted to see it. And I never had a kid turn me down. You know, and in fact, they'd be like, can I go show so-and-so these? And they'd walk out into the waiting room with the box of cremains to show somebody else. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, just pre again, preparing kids for what to expect and what they can do. Okay, so what happens, because I think we all have this fear, what if I don't know what to say? Um, and so my standard thing, if I have a conversation with one of my kids that <clears throat> just feels like I didn't really have the answers and I didn't really help them that much, I will say, you know, I, I don't exactly know, and that's, that would be hard for me too, um, but I definitely don't want you to be alone with this. So. I want you to know that you can still talk to me if it's still worrying you and I can always, if I don't, if we haven't come up, we can't, if I haven't thought of a solution, I can ask somebody, you know, my, I just don't want them to be holding it in because they think I can't handle it. Um, and then also I think it's a good idea to check in rather than just waiting for them to bring it up. Okay. So given what we've talked about so far, you can test yourself on this. And I would say the answer here would be C. So obviously as a former grief counselor, I'm a big fan of counseling and therapy in general. And especially if kids have had a significant loss, someone in their immediate, immediate family or a complicated loss where a person died and there's no body or they were overseas or it was a traumatic or a sudden death. Um, so what are some indicators that we would want kids to have maybe grief counseling? Um, or play therapy, depending upon their age. Um, and so this can be that the, it's normal to have fears, but these are lasting over long periods of time, kind of more pervasive and obsessive, like not being able to sleep, not being able to have the lights out, you know, uh, not being able to go to school. Um, so this is over kind of more months, more risk-taking behaviors, you know, if they're older. Um, more kind of pervasive withdrawal. They just seem really shut down. 
or not kind of experiencing a lot of joy. Again, more persistent aggression, you know, beyond kind of the first few weeks that it's really just kind of sticking around. Um, big changes in sleeping or weight that are persistent or that there's some sort of complicated relationship with the deceased uh, in some way, you know, something unresolved. There was a fight, they were separated, you know, things like that that we want to address. This little image, by the way, is of sand tray, which is a form of play therapy that grief counselor or that play therapists can do and grief counselors often do with kids. And so you can see it's um, you have a lot of objects that kids can arrange in a tray of sand to kind of tell you about their world or to tell you about the death event or to tell you about a funeral service or to tell you about the person. So you can just see in this picture that there's a little casket there and a cross and you know some other symbols and so this can give us insight it can help kids process and it can also give us insight into what their concerns are okay um, so bibliotherapy reading books there's always lots of great books and i've listed some here that um, have been recommended to me or i enjoyed for kids um, you can always ask children's librarians for whatever a kid might be struggling with to say i need some books on this for this age and they'll pull a stack for you and you can go in and look through them and then check out what you want. Um, we've touched on play therapy a little bit, but that can also be combined with art therapy where children are drawing pictures or, um, you know, playing with toys to give you a sense of, you know, how they're processing things. Um, you can be doing family therapy. And then there's some nice, you know, just group therapy in camps for kids, like kids bereavement camps who have had someone close to them die. So this is an optional TED Talk. If you're interested in more about this, I'd encourage you to, to, to watch it and think about kind of what, what are the takeaways for what to say and what not to say.